started with a rumble deep in the earth, a quick jolt that shook the trees and cracked the silence of summer evening in Alaska. It was July the 9th, 1958, just before 10.15 p.m., and the unthinkable was about to happen. In Latuya Bay, a long, narrow ford tucked into the remote wilds of southeast Alaska. A mountain section, bigger than most office buildings, broke free and crashed into the bay. It didn't slide. It didn't crumble. It dropped. 90 million tons of rock slammed into the water like a meteor strike, and the splash that followed was colossal. If you're struggling with a figure of 90 million tons, well, this is going to blow your mind, because that equals roughly 100 Golden Gate Bridges. Unsurprisingly, what rose from that impact wasn't just a wave, it was a vertical wall of water, 524 meters high, or 1,720 feet. That's taller than the Empire State Building, it's taller than the Shard. It ripped up trees, soil, rock, everything on the hillside, scraping it clean like someone swiped it with a giant blade. And then it came rushing down. Three fishing boats were anchored inside the bay when they saw the beast hurtling towards them. Two of them survived, one didn't. What those survivors described doesn't sound like something from Earth. This wasn't a tsunami in the way that we usually understand them. There was no undersea earthquake far away, and no long wall of water that was steadily building across the ocean. This was local, this was violent and immediate. A mega tsunami so colossal it's difficult to believe that it even really happened. The Tuya Bay doesn't sound dangerous. If anything, it looks absurdly peaceful, flanked by steep forested cliffs and with glacial blue waters like glass and nothing but bald eagles and the occasional grizzly bear to disturb the view. It's a lovely sight, but beneath that postcard calm, it's built like a loaded gun, or perhaps an intercontinental ballistic missile. First off, the bay itself isn't really a bay, it's a ford. It's narrow, it's long, and carved deep by retreating glaciers with sides that drop almost vertically into the water. The entrance is a tight squeeze, barely wide enough for two boats to pass, while the back of the bay opens into what looks like a natural amphitheater of stone and snow. It's beautiful. It's lethal. Running right through it is the Fairweather Fault, an offshoot of the San Andreas system, which is where the Pacific and North American plates meet, grind, and occasionally flip out. Earthquakes here, they aren't rare, they are expected. And when the ground shifts, those cliffs go from being beautifully dramatic towers to precarious ledges holding millions of tons of rock and ice in place until they don't. And this is what makes Latuya Bay uniquely terrifying. The combination of steep slopes, deep water, and seismic activity. The water is over 610 meters or 2,000 feet deep in places, which means it can absorb and then unleash staggering amounts of energy. It's got just about everything you need for a massive disaster. When that mountain chunk dropped into the bay, it didn't just displace water. It unleashed the kind of apocalyptic hell that we just haven't seen in the modern age. And it's happened before. Smaller slides, lesser waves, decades apart, but all pointing to the same thing. Latuya Bay is a natural trap, patiently waiting. Everything about it's wrong, geologically speaking. And in 1958, well, it showed its teeth. But before we get to this record-breaking monster, just how common are mega tsunamis? Is this something we should be more worried about? Well, yes, and also no. We should be more concerned about asteroids and deadly diseases sweeping Earth, but humans are, to put it kindly, easily distracted and tend not to like dwelling on the fact that our species could be extinguished in the blink of an eye. It's not very comforting. So no, this doesn't happen often, but it does absolutely happen. Back in prehistoric times, around 8,000 years ago, the Storega slide off the coast of Norway triggered what may have been one of the largest tsunamis Europe has ever seen. A massive section of the continental shelf collapsed into the North Atlantic, sending waves up to 20 meters or 66 feet high, crashing into the coasts of Scotland and Northern Europe. Before that, there was actually a piece of terrain called Doggerland that connected Britain to mainland Europe. After it, well, let's just say that the British weren't walking over to France anytime soon. Doggerland completely vanished. To be fair, this was also thanks to rising sea levels at the time, but the catastrophic Storega slide was what really finished it off. Now let's fast forward to 1792 in Japan, and Mount Unzen then decided that it was done playing nice. An earthquake triggered a landslide that plummeted into the Ariake Sea, displacing water so violently that it killed around 15,000 people. Waves surged into nearby towns, leveling anything in their path. 
Japan, with its volcanic spine and rugged coastline, has always been a mega tsunami candidate, and Anzen proved the point. More recently, a landslide in the Grand Banks of Newfoundland triggered a massive underwater slump. Though it didn't produce waves quite as tall, it still killed 28 people and snapped transatlantic telegraph cables on the seafloor. And then there's Anak Krakatoa in 2018. When part of the volcano collapsed into the sea, it caused a tsunami that killed over 400 people in Indonesia. It wasn't the height that was terrifying, it was the speed and surprise. Like Lituya, it struck with no time to run, no time to warn, no time for anything. All right, so July the 9th, 1958 started our calm, bright sky is still there, just another quiet evening in the Alaskan wilderness. But under the surface, the Earth was winding up for something cataclysmic. At 10.15 p.m., a magnitude 7.8 earthquake struck along the Fairweather Fault. Uh, that's big. It's powerful enough to rattle cities hundreds of miles away, let alone a narrow, unstable ford. On the northeast wall of the bay, a section of mountain, shattered and fractured from years of pressure, finally gave way. Remember, a hundred Golden Gate Bridges worth of rock, trees, and ice broke free and plummeted more than 914 meters or 3,000 feet into the water below. This wasn't a landslide. It was a rockfall on an almost unimaginable scale, traveling at about 160 kilometers an hour or 100 miles per hour. The force was enough to displace a chunk of water the size of a small town. And that's when the bay changed instantly. The impact didn't just create waves, it launched them. Water had nowhere to go except up and out. A mega surge shot directly across the inlet, stripped everything on the opposite slope clean and climbed up to a height that no one thought possible, 524 meters or 1,720 feet. Entire forests vanished, soil was blasted from bedrock, anything alive in that splash zone was gone before it knew what hit it. Within moments, that wave had turned Latuya Bay into a blender of broken trees and seawater. The survivors later said it was like being dropped into the middle of a hurricane, only worse. No wind, just water, moving fast, rising higher, and sounding like the world itself was splitting open. It didn't last long. A few terrifying minutes, and it was all over. But what it left behind would rewrite the books on what we thought waves could do. There were three boats in Latuya Bay that night, three small vessels anchored in what should have been a peaceful sheltered inlet. Those on the Badger got lucky. Her crew, a married couple, saw the wave rise and somehow managed to board a skiff before their larger boat was smashed to pieces. They were shaken, but they were alive. This was more than could be said for the sun more, the smallest of the three. She vanished, with no distress call, no wreckage found. Just gone, snapped up by a wall of water. Then there was the Erdy. On board was Howard Ulrich and his seven-year-old son, Sonny. They had been fishing and were hoping for a quiet night. Instead, they found themselves at the foot of a wave taller than a skyscraper. Ulrich would later describe the moment with the kind of clarity that only comes from surviving something that shouldn't be survivable. They didn't try to run. They couldn't. The water came too fast. All he could do was cut the anchor line, start the engine, and hope. And somehow, it worked. The surge picked up the Latuya II, flung it like a toy through the bay, and dropped it back into the water, battered but afloat. When Ulrich spoke about it later, he said it was like being inside a washing machine that wanted to kill you. Sonny was unharmed, just a little shaken. But to be fair, who wouldn't be? When scientists arrived at Lutuya Bay after the wave, they weren't just stunned, they were borderline disbelieving. The wall of water climbed so far up the opposite slope of the bay that the vegetation line was erased, trees were shredded, roots were ripped out, and soil scraped away. They measured the scarring left on the hillside, the so-called trim line, and it confirmed what the survivors already knew, that this was the biggest wave ever recorded in human history. And it wasn't by a small margin. Ordinary tsunamis are massive, yeah but they usually peak at about 10 to 30 meters, or 33 to 98 feet. The 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami reached 30 meters, or 98 feet in some places, just over 40 meters, or 131 feet at its worst. Lituya Bay dwarfed them spectacularly. 524 meters high, 1,720 feet. But it didn't behave like a traditional tsunami. It didn't race across the ocean for hours or strike distant shores. It rose and fell right there in the bay, localized, 
over before you knew what happened, but far more violent than anything anyone expected from a landslide-triggered event. And yet, quite remarkably, it didn't kill thousands, it didn't devastate a coastline, it didn't become a global tragedy because Latuya Bay is so remote. There was damage, but it was minimal considering what had just happened. Over in Yakutat, the only proper settlement anywhere near the epicenter, bridges twisted, docks splintered, and oil pipelines snapped like cheap string. A wave tower came crashing down, and one cabin was left so battered it might as well have been scrap wood. Along the coast to the southeast, the ground split open with sand boils, also known as sand volcanoes, while underwater cables keeping Alaska's communication lines alive were neatly severed. Further afield, Pelican and Sitka reported damage too. But when you think the most enormous tsunami in modern history had just occurred, the damage was miraculously light. If it had happened anywhere near civilization, the death toll would have been monumental. It's easy to think of mega tsunamis as these freak events, the flukes buried in the past, but geologists are increasingly nervous about a few places where the ingredients for another disaster are already lined up and waiting to happen. One such suspect is the Cumbra Vieja volcano on La Palma in the Canary Islands. For years, scientists have warned that a future eruption could send a vast chunk of the island sliding into the Atlantic. The worst case scenario is a wave potentially hundreds of meters high racing westward and slamming into the east coast of North America. Cities like New York, Boston, and Miami wouldn't have hours to evacuate, you might have minutes. Before you start getting too worried, the US Geological Service estimates the wave would reach the US and be about one to two meters high, similar to a storm surge, so probably no need to keep the disaster gear locked and loaded just yet. Greenland is another sleeping giant. As its glaciers melt and retreat, they're leaving huge slopes of rock teetering above deep fords. In 2017, a landslide triggered a tsunami that destroyed a village and killed four people. It wasn't even that large, and it still hit with devastating force. If a larger section were to collapse into one of Greenland's deeper inlets, the wave could be far taller and travel much further. Even Alaska remains on high alert. Scientists have flagged several unstable slopes, including one near Barry Arm that's ticking time bombs. If it goes, it could send a mega tsunami down Prince William Sound, endangering communities and infrastructure. So, could it happen again? Well, short answer to that is, yeah. The long answer is absolutely yes, and probably not where you're looking. Latuya Bay hasn't seen another mega tsunami since 1958, but it's far from dormant. In fact, if you go the other way, you see a trend. In the past 170 years, Latuya Bay has seen four tsunamis topping 30 meters or 100 feet. In 1854, it reached around 120 meters or 395 feet. In 1899, about 60 meters or 200 feet. In 1936, roughly 150 meters or 490 feet. And then in 1958, the monster. Smaller landslides have rumbled down its slopes before, and the fault line beneath it is still twitching. Geologists keep one eye on the bay and the other on every other steep-sided ford with deep water and shaky cliffs. But there's only so much you can watch. The unsettling truth is that Latuya wasn't a one-off, and it will almost certainly happen again at some point. The same ingredients, steep terrain, unstable geology, and deep water exist in other parts of Alaska, Greenland, British Columbia, and even Norway. Add climate change to the mix and things start looking even shakier, pun intended. As permafrost melts and glaciers retreat, the rock that used to anchor becomes looser and looser means more likely to fall. In 2015, a similar event occurred in Tarn Ford in Alaska. Not quite as tall, but still terrifying, which saw a huge slope collapse, hit the water, and produce a wave that stripped trees 193 meters or 633 feet up the hillside. The only reason you didn't hear about it is because nobody was there. That's luck, not safety. One second, it's a beautiful bay. The next, it's a vertical ocean coming straight at you. So yes, it will happen again. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not for decades, and maybe not in Latuya Bay. But one day, a wall of water will rise, and humans won't be so lucky. Thank you for watching.